Tomorrow is June 1st. Now think back with me all the way to March 1st, before all of this pandemic happened. And a lot has changed, a lot has happened, not just in our world, but in each of us personally from March 1st to June 1st. And I've heard a lot of people try to describe or explain what the last several months has been like for them. Now out of all of those explanations, I don't think anything can sum it up better than this right here. (laughs) From March 1st, to June 1st. So much has changed. Our world is different. We are different. It's obviously not the year that we expected it to be, all because of this one word, pandemic. Now that one word, pandemic, is actually two words thrown together. Pan, meaning all, and demic, meaning a certain population of people. So quite literally, that word means all people, specifically referring to a threat to all people. And in the midst of a threat or crisis, a difficulty or a tragedy, there's a specific Bible verse that we tend to hold tightly to. And rightfully so. It's one that gets used a lot in moments and seasons like this. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. We're told this. And we know that God causes everything, even pandemics, that God used causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. It's a great verse, and it's not just catchy and cliche, and it's not just a verse to throw on the side of a coffee mug. It's true, because that's what God does. He takes everything, everything, and has a way of changing it and turning it in to something good for his purpose. And that has been an encouragement for me during the last several months, and I'm sure it has been for you as well. In the early church, the early Christians, they were dealing with their own version of a pandemic. Now, not necessarily a virus like you and I have been dealing with. Their pandemic, their threat to all Christians was a man named Saul who was persecuting the Christians. He was set at, he was bent on destroying the early church. But this man, Saul, would later become known as Paul had a name change. And Paul, as we know him today, is one of the most influential leaders of the early church. He was one of the most passionate followers of Jesus. Now, I bring that up because that verse we just read, that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him, that was written by Paul, formerly known as Saul, the one persecuting the early church. See, Paul didn't just write those words. He lived those words out. He saw firsthand the power of God in his own life because that's what God does. That's the power of God. That's the life-changing power of God. And that's the story we're going to look at this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Acts chapter 9. And as you've been following with us over the last several weeks, we have been looking at the early church, what they do, how they started, and how they continued to live their lives following Jesus. And Saul's story, his life-changing story, is a huge part of how the early church began and where it went from there. So, Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1, we're told this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, and the way is another word for the church, that if he found anyone in Damascus that belonged to the church, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So if you remember back, this persecuted, this persecution started with the stoning of Stephen. We looked at his story a few weeks ago. And now Saul is literally chasing down and hunting down Christians that have fled Jerusalem because of this mass persecution. Here's what happens next. Verse 3. As Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So Jesus meets Saul and quite literally has a face-to-face conversation with him. 
And the light that was talked about here was literally a blinding light. So Saul is blind, and Jesus gives him specific instructions on where to go in Damascus. So Saul's companions help him up. They lead him into the city just as Jesus instructed. Now, also in Damascus, in the city of Damascus, there's a Christian named Ananias. And Ananias also got a message from Jesus. Jesus tells Ananias through a vision to go to this house where Saul would be. And he gives him instructions on not just how to find Saul, but how to help Saul. Look at Ananias' response to Jesus when he hears Jesus' instructions. Verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. In other words, Jesus, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're asking. But are you sure? Are you positive? Are we talking about the same person? You're talking about the same Saul I'm talking about, right? You want me to go help him. Here's Jesus' reply to Ananias' concerns. Verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man, and look at this part, don't miss this. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. There it is. That's that Romans 8, 28 being lived out. That, that Jesus is saying, Saul, the, the instrument that has been used for hate and evil and, and murder and destruction, he is my chosen instrument. And I'm going to use him to proclaim my name, Jesus says. Don't miss that. The instruments that we may see as being used for something terrible and evil Jesus says, no, I'm going to use that. He is my instrument, and he is going to be used for my good. So Ananias goes to see Saul. Here's the rest of the story. Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus and at once, immediately, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. That's a life change story. That's Romans 8, 28 lived out. That is what Jesus does. Now, in this part of Saul's story, it focuses around two individuals, obviously Saul, but also Ananias and his part, the role that he played in Saul's life change story. Now, both Saul and Ananias, their stories are centered around Jesus and his interaction with them. They both met Jesus. They were both changed by Jesus. Jesus gave both of them very specific instructions when he spoke to them. And that's what I want you and I to pay attention to. Both heard from Jesus, Saul and Ananias, but they both heard something different. So let's ask that question. What did they hear from Jesus? And do we still hear those same things in our stories, in our lives today? So the first thing that we look at is, Saul, what did he hear from Jesus? Well, he heard Jesus say, turn around. Remember, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you fighting against me? Why are you going that direction? And he tells Saul, turn around, change your life. Instead of running away from me, move back to me. Instead of being one that is persecuting me, would you preach my name? Jesus told Saul to turn around. Jesus still tells you and me the exact same thing. He still calls to us to turn around, to turn our lives around. So which part of your lives... Are you moving away from Jesus instead of towards Jesus? Another way to think about it is what would Jesus call out in your life? For Saul, he called out, why are you persecuting me? What would he say to you? What would he say to me? Brian, Brian, why are you? And how would we finish that sentence? How would Jesus finish that sentence? One great encouragement that we can take from Saul's story of turning his life around is that it's never too late to turn around. As long as you are still breathing and alive, it's not too late to turn your life around. You 
are never too, and what excuse might you use? You are never too what to turn around. I would tell you that you are never too far gone to turn around. That you are never too far down the wrong path to turn around. You're never too guilty to turn around. You should never feel too ashamed to turn around. It is never too late. As long as you have breath in your lungs, it's never too late to turn around. When I was in college, I was driving around a downtown area. Now you need to know, I did not grow up downtown. I grew up in the suburbs of town. So these whole one-way streets and the grid of downtown, I was very unfamiliar with. I remember driving down a road and needing to turn left. So I turned left onto this street. And I realized rather quickly I had made a mistake. Because as I turned left onto this street, I wondered why all these lights were facing me instead of going with me. You probably guessed it. I turned the wrong way down a one-way street, and my heart just stopped. I freaked out. I got off that road as quick as I possibly could. Actually, the reality of the story is, is I hopped a curb to get off the road, to get into the parking lot, so I could turn around and go the right direction. And it, it scared me. I was embarrassed. I was like, no one else saw that, right? And, of course, all these cars are just honking as they pass by me. But once I realized what I had done, once I came to realize that I was going the wrong way, down a one way, I changed the direction I was going as fast as I possibly could. I didn't wait for anything. I didn't delay. I didn't even wait for another street. I jumped the curb so that I could turn around. Why is it then, when we realize that we're going the wrong direction, why do we wait? Can I encourage you, plead with you, that if you realize you're going the wrong way, immediately do whatever it takes to right then, right there, don't wait, turn around. Because that's what, that's what Saul did. If you look at verse 20, after he had the change of heart, after he recognized he was going the wrong way, after he met Jesus, verse 20 says, at once, immediately, he didn't wait for anything. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. At once. When Jesus calls you to turn your life around, we follow him immediately and at once. That word or that phrasing of turning around, the the churchy word, you might have heard this, is repent. Repent just literally means that though. Turn around. It's a U-turn. You're going one direction, you repent, you turn, turn around and go the other direction, the complete opposite direction that you were going. That's what repent means. And throughout Scripture, New Testament and Old Testament, repentance is a big theme because it's a big deal in our relationship with him when Jesus tells us to turn around. Jesus even specifically talks about this idea of repenting and turning around. You might have heard it as the the story of the prodigal son. Jesus tells a story of a son that walks away from his father, goes his own direction, goes his own path, which ends up being a destructive path. Over time, the son finally comes to his senses and he finally realizes what he has been doing, the direction that he has gone. And in the lowest of his lows, in the filth of a pig pen, this son turns his life around and he gets up and he walks back home to his dad. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. That is what Jesus called Saul to do. And that is what Saul heard, to turn his life around. Around And it's never too late to turn around. So that's what Saul heard. But let's look at Ananias. What did he hear from Jesus? Because it was very different than what Saul heard. Remember what Jesus commanded, what he gave instructions to, to Ananias to do? He said, go find Saul and told him where to find him and then go and help him. And again, rightfully so, Ananias had a lot of concerns and reservations because of the reputation of Saul. But he still followed God's leading, and he went to see Saul. And I want you to pay attention to how Ananias talked with with Saul, how he interacted with Saul. Here's what he said. It says in verse 17, Ananias went to the house and entered it. Look, placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. Do you see the word he used there? He called Saul brother He said, Brother Saul, that's that's the name that you would give a family member, not somebody who came here to try to kill you and arrest you and try to destroy the church that you're part of. He treated Saul like family. 
And then he helped him. He placed his hands on him and allowed him to be able to see again. Ananias treated Saul as one of the believers because that's what he was now. Notice Ananias didn't bring up his past. He didn't demand an apology. He didn't ask for an explanation. He didn't bring anything else up. He just said, Brother Saul. In other words, you're part of the family. Who is somebody that Jesus has put in your life that is going the wrong way? Another way to ask it is, who is Jesus calling you to help? Regardless of reputation, regardless of what they've done, regardless of the direction of their life that they're heading, regardless of their past choices, their mistakes, and their decisions, is Jesus asking you to help them? Who is Jesus asking you to help? Now, we can't help everyone all the time, and that's not, what, that's not the point here. And in fact, Paul, later on, as he's writing to one of the early churches, he brings up this idea of helping those that are going the wrong direction. In Galatians chapter 6, he speaks to that. He says, if you notice somebody that's going the wrong direction, that's going the wrong way, help them. And he helps us understand how to help them. He says, treat them with gentleness. Gently correct them. He even says that we should carry their burdens. But I don't want you to miss in verse 3. Listen to this. He says, if you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourselves. Look at this. You are not that important. I love that. Because oftentimes when we feel like God is calling us to help someone, we have a bunch of excuses. Well, I can't right now, or they've done this, or I'm in the middle of this. We have all the excuses on why not to help. Let me be clear. When Jesus is clear, that you should help someone, when he specifically, intentionally places you in the path and the life of someone else, we stop what we're doing, just like Ananias, and we help. So what are some of those excuses that you might fill in the blank with? Let me say, you are never too, whatever excuse you, you and I can come up with, to help. You're never too, as Paul says, you're never too important to help. You're never too busy to help. You're never too poor to help. There's no excuse we could come up with that when God intentionally places us in the life of somebody else, in our paths cross, we stop what we're doing and we help. We've talked about that partnership before, how God uses us to play a part in someone else's story of life change. You see, for Saul, it was because of meeting Jesus and because of Ananias' help that his direction in life radically changed. It was the change of heart that only could happen because of Jesus. But it was also the help and the support of Ananias that helped him take those next steps. And again, Saul later becomes known as Paul, how you and I usually refer to him. Paul is known for planting churches, for spreading the gospel, for passionately preaching the name of Jesus, for raising up other pastors and even writing a good portion of the New Testament. That's what Paul becomes known for. Ananias is not known for any of those things. No, this is one little story we get of Ananias, but it's a big part in Saul's story. This one part that Ananias gets to play made all the difference in the world for Saul, who we now know as Paul. So Paul goes on and continues his journey of spreading the gospel, telling the story of Jesus, but also his own story. And I want to read how he talks about his story to one of the early churches. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. And as I read through this, how he talks about his story, I want you to listen to the three parts of Paul's story. Because you and I have those same three parts. Here's how he describes it. Verse 13. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion. How I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for their traditions of my ancestors. Verse 15. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. Did you hear those three parts? Paul says, I was You know who I was. You know of my reputation before meeting Jesus, before changing. I was persecuting the church. But then God showed up. But then God chose me. Then God called me and he changed my life. And Paul says, now I am a preacher of the gospel. He goes from a persecutor to a preacher. 
all because of that important moment where Jesus changed everything. That's our story as well. We might fill in the blanks a little bit differently, but that's our story. I was then God, radically and forever changed my life. Now I am. Because of Jesus, now I am a new creation. Because of Jesus, I am adopted as his child and known as a child of God. I am chosen and dearly loved. I am forgiven. I am no longer condemned. I am not alone. I am not helpless. I am known and wonderfully made. See, we're all on a journey. We're all walking through life. And if you think with me, think back to where you've been, the steps that you have taken, the choices and decisions you've made that sent you in a specific direction. We all have a past, and we all are where we are because of our past, good or bad. And we can't change what we've done. We can't change the steps that we have already taken. So what do we do now when we wake up and we're where we find ourselves today? Matt Marr wrote a song called Turn Around. And I hope this speaks to your heart as it is spoken to mine. When we find out, when we realize where we currently are today, I pray this gives you insight on what to take as your next step. His song says this, If you're scared that you don't matter, if you're lost and need to be found, if you're looking for a savior, all you gotta do is turn around. Some turn to a bottle Some turn to a drug. Some turn to another's arms. But it seems like it's never enough. Well, I won't say that you will never fail again. But there is grace to wash away your every sin. You do not have to take the broken road. You can turn around and come home. Jesus tells us, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' words. So yes, we can't do anything about the steps we have already taken. But what are you going to do with your next step? What direction are you going to go right now? Wherever you are today, what step will you take tomorrow? Where will you go from here? Will you turn around? Will you stop what you're doing and change direction to go help someone else? What does your next step look like as you listen for Jesus' calling to you? I want to just share quickly two beliefs uh, that I hold very tightly to, that I think, I hope, will be helpful for you. And, And we see these out of Saul's story. The first one is, I believe Jesus changes lives, even mine. I look at the story of Saul and what Jesus did in his life, and I I look at that and I was like, wow, if that's what Jesus can do in a man like Saul's life, what could he do in mine? And And I can only imagine what he might do in me and with me and through me. So I believe that Jesus changes lives, even mine, regardless of where I've been and what I've done, he can still change my life. Second belief, I believe that Jesus changes lives, even theirs. See, there's no person that could be so far away that Jesus can't or won't reach out to them. Again, we are never too far away to turn our life around. We are never too far away from Jesus where he can't or won't reach out to us. Those two beliefs, for me personally, have changed every moment of every day because it changes how I think of myself. It changes how I view myself. It gives me hope. It changes how I view other people changes how I treat other people. It changes how I pray and and how I help. Because if you believe in Jesus, if you believe like me that Jesus died for our sins, died for the sins of the world, and then he came back to life three days later, not just conquering sin, but also conquering death. If you believe that, and that he gives us life, new life and eternal life, and if you believe that, then you believe in the power of Jesus. You believe in the life-changing power of Jesus. So I believe that Jesus changes lives. Mine and everybody else's. If you believe 
that Jesus can change lives. He can change yours and everyone else's because that's what Jesus does. He takes all things and he works them for his good. I want to give you an opportunity to make some of those next steps, to make some of those changes, whether that's to turn around or whether that's to change direction to go help someone else. So as we pray together this morning, would you, between you and the Lord, would you begin to, in your heart, take those next steps? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for changing my life, for having the reputation of changing lives no matter how far away we go from you, no matter what we've done and where we've been. We are never too far away from you where you cannot and will not reach out to us. Oh, thank you for, for the power of life change, for meeting us where we are and changing our next steps. So Jesus, speak to us. We're listening. Open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds and our eyes to hear what you're saying to us, to see where you're leading us, to turn around, reveal to us in the parts of our lives where we need to turn around, where we need to repent, where we need to walk away from where we're going and make a new direction towards you. Help us to turn around. Help us to see who you are putting in our path, who you're calling us to help, where we need to have a change of direction to go and help somebody else in their own direction, in their own walk with you. Help us to turn around. Help us to help others, all because of you, all because of your life-changing power at work in us. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We can't wait to see what you will do in our lives and in the lives of others. In your name we pray.